China's wave of virus deaths expanding across the country, now hitting smaller cities and rural areas. Flight bookings falling short in China despite the upcoming travel season and Beijing's newly opened borders. Classified documents discovered at President Biden's private office. At the heart of the scandal, the Penn Biden Center, the University of Pennsylvania and its financial ties to China. A grand jury in Boston indicting a Chinese student at Berkeley. We look at the charge that could put the man behind bars for a decade. And another Chinese student recounting how he switched from a supporter of the Chinese communist regime to a leader of its opposition. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Don Ma in for Tiffany. Before we dive into today's news, make sure to use the link below to subscribe to our newsletter. Each week, we'll round up the highlights and controversies happening around China and the world and share an exclusive behind the scenes snapshot with our readers. Keep an eye out. The newsletter will land in your inbox Friday morning. China's ongoing wave of virus deaths is reaching new regions, now hitting smaller cities and rural areas. Inside a funeral home in a mid-sized city in central China, one room is full of caskets. And the area outside the funeral home is overcrowded. It's the same situation for funeral homes in a region of southern China's Guangdong province. We spoke to a staff member there. You have to make an appointment three days earlier. There is no way for you to choose a specific time. The whole of Shantou City is like this. The whole of China is like this. There are many corpses. On Wednesday, people were seen lining up outside a funeral home in southern China's Shenzhen City. While in one rural area, relatives held a traditional ceremony to say goodbye to their loved ones. In an area neighboring Beijing called Tianjin City, construction is underway at one funeral home. The facility is adding an expansion to boost its capacity. And on the country's east coast, one city is building a new funeral home. The World Health Organization is pressing China, asking for greater transparency about COVID-19 variants circulating in the country. WHO officials are also saying that the country is underreporting its death toll. Here's more on what the agency is saying. WHO still believes that uh, deaths are heavily underreported uh, from China. Uh, COVID-19 is spiking in China after the regime reversed its zero COVID policy in December. Infections and deaths are reportedly overwhelming hospitals and funeral homes. WHO officials say that China is providing information on its response to the most recent outbreaks, but not enough. There are some very important information gaps that we are working with China to fill. The WHO is requesting that China's CDC share the sequences of the COVID variants with the public. That is so experts worldwide can analyze the data. The effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccine produced and distributed in China has also come into question. And the zero COVID policy has left much of the Chinese population without natural immunity. So the population as a whole has no herd immunity. One study from a UK health data company estimates about 9,000 deaths each day in late December. The first week since Beijing opened its borders, flights are falling short. Travel data from Forward Keys said Thursday that China's outbound flight bookings were at just 15 percent of pre-pandemic levels. China's travel sector faces a number of challenges as it looks to recover. Low airline capacity, high airfares, new pre-flight COVID-19 testing requirements by many countries, and a backlog of passport and visa applications. Forward Key's vice president of Insights explained, although Chinese New Year is likely to see international travel rebound for the first time in three years, we will need to wait longer before we see a resurgence in Chinese tourists exploring the globe. China's handling of COVID-19 has stoked the ire of mainlanders. Some are making a spontaneous decision to draw a line in the sand with the regime. More mainland Chinese citizens are joining Tui Dang, a worldwide grassroots movement to quit the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, and its affiliated entities. The movement began in 2004. Since then, more than 400 million Chinese have walked away from the party. 
One of them, living overseas, announced his decision to quit the Young Pioneers and the Communist Youth League. The Communist Party requires every Chinese student to join these two while in school. Explaining why he made the decision, he said for three years, he wasn't able to return home to visit his family, blaming it on COVID-19, which the Chinese regime allowed to spread unchecked around the world. Many experts cite Beijing's history of underreporting health data as a cause. When he finally made it back home this year, he was placed in mandatory quarantine for eight days upon landing in China. He described being forced to take virus tests daily or every other day. He questioned why a healthy man living overseas was being treated like an enemy in his homeland. In another case, a group of 25 people made a joint announcement to quit the Communist Party. They, too, cited authorities' mishandling of the pandemic and the current overflow in China's crematoriums. Different than the Pledge of Allegiance in the United States, the CCP makes citizens take an oath to the Communist Party. The New York-based Global Tuidang Center, also known as the Global Center for Quitting the CCP, is encouraging Chinese to renounce this oath. Most use pseudonyms to quit, to protect their identities or family members in China from retaliation. Classified documents have been discovered at President Biden's private office, the Penn Biden Center. The documents are from Biden's time as vice president years ago. They're not meant to be stored in a private office. At the heart of the scandal is also the University of Pennsylvania, which houses the Penn Biden Center. And the university's influx of donations from China has increasingly become a subject of interest. Let's zoom in on why. It received nearly $80 million in gifts and contracts from China between 2014 and 2020. And the Washington Free Beacon reports that foreign donations tripled in the two years following the Biden Center opening in 2017, with most of those funds coming from China. A Penn spokesperson says that Penn is fully compliant with federal law regarding the reporting of foreign gifts and contracts. Meanwhile, Hunter Biden apparently discussed the center by email before its launch. In 2016, creative artist agency agent Craig Gehring sent an email to Hunter Biden with, quote, confidential notes from their meeting. Gehring listed apparent plans that were discussed for Biden after leaving office. One of those plans included wealth creation with no additional explanation, while another included an apparent reference to the Penn Biden Center with a possible job opportunity for Hunter. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is considering banning Chinese entities from purchasing property in the state. The reason? The economic and security risks posed by China's communist regime. NTD's Daniel Monahan has more. We do not need to have CCP influence um, in Florida's economy. The remarks follow warnings from security experts and lawmakers that the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, is seeking to purchase strategic parcels of land throughout the United States. Security experts believe the CCP intends to conduct espionage or otherwise sabotage U.S. national security interests from them. We don't want to have holdings uh, by hostile nations. And so if you look at the Chinese Communist Party, they've been very active throughout the Western Hemisphere in gobbling up land. Chinese investors purchased more than $6 billion in U.S. real estate between March 2021 and March 2022. DeSantis says keeping the CCP from buying farmland is a positive step for which he has proposed legislation, but believes more can be done. Yeah, no farmland, but why would you want them buying residential developments or things like that? But he says it won't be the CCP directly signing contracts. So legislation has to be structured to effectively police it and prevent the use of holding companies and other devices. DeSantis expressed that Florida has already been active in keeping out the influence of the CCP, mentioning how the Sunshine State banned Confucius Institutes. They have used those Confucius Institutes across the country uh, to basically bring propaganda into our universities, as if our universities don't have enough problems already. He says Florida has also taken steps to limit the CCP's ability to fund research in Florida universities. Though outrage over the issue has been widespread in recent months, there have been relatively few concrete actions taken to curb the flow of U.S. land to CCP-aligned organizations. 
Representative Elise Stefanik of New York and Rick Crawford of Arkansas introduced legislation to improve national security by preventing foreign adversaries from taking any ownership or control of the United States agricultural industry. While Washington Congressman Dan Newhouse introduced legislation in November that would prohibit foreign nationals associated with the CCP from buying any farmland. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. A federal grand jury in Boston is indicting a student from the Berklee College of Music. The student is Wu Xiaolei from China. Prosecutors allege Wu stalked and harassed a person that supported Chinese democracy. The indictment document said the person posted flyers near the Berkeley campus with messages such as, Stand with Chinese people and we want freedom. Wu allegedly dared the person to post more of the materials, saying he would cut off her hands if she did. Wu also allegedly threatened that authorities in China would seek out this person's family. Wu was arrested last December. If convicted, he faces up to 10 years in prison and up to $500,000 fine. And another Chinese student from a staunch supporter of the Chinese Communist Party to the leader of an overseas anti-CCP group. What caused a dramatic shift? We spoke with Wester Yang, a Chinese student living in Canada, for his story. They must not fall and we must not retreat. We cannot let the butchers appear tall and block the wind of freedom in this land. Among overseas solidarity for China's white paper revolution, Wester Yang's voice was heard loud and clear. The university student formed an anti-CCP group in Toronto called Assembly of Citizens. But Yang said he started out as a so-called little pink. The term is given to young Chinese filled with extreme nationalist pride who defend the party against any and all criticism. Through reading history books, Yang came to realize the true nature of the Chinese communist regime. Both his faith in the party and his worldview faltered. Now he's calling himself a rebel. When I became a little pink, I was acting out of the kind of patriotism from the Chinese Communist Party propaganda. Now that I'm a rebel, my motivation remains the same. I still love China, but now this China doesn't equal the Chinese Communist Party, and my love is purely for this land and its people. He spoke of the sorrow and anger that prompted his change. These feelings arose from witnessing the torture of his countrymen in China and the persecution of their freedom of speech and belief. The Communist Party's sins come out of every pore and every breath, from south to north. Where in the whole of China is not a concentration camp? The Cultural Revolution happened, not because Mao himself is a deviant, it's the system. The event was just a flower that grew out of the intertwined poisonous vine that creeps across China. The key is, there's no point in just removing its flowers without chopping off its roots. Last November, Yang joined support for a protester who hung an anti-lockdown banner on a bridge in Beijing. This demonstration was the trigger for the blank paper movement afterwards, a protest movement standing up against Beijing's suppression and strict pandemic lockdown measures. I will look back on what I did in 10, 20 or 30 years before I die. If I can say with a clear conscience that I did everything I could in China's darkest hour, then I won't regret it. Yang said he still chose to step forward and protest despite facing threats and intimidation. And even though, he'll never be able to return to his hometown in China. Washington is announcing new steps to arm Japan in the face of growing Chinese aggression. This comes before President Biden's meeting with the Japanese Prime Minister on Friday. NTD's Kuss Temenis has the latest. In a joint press conference, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and their Japanese counterparts called China an unprecedented threat to the international order. Both countries expressed their commitment for a strengthened alliance in the Indo-Pacific. I think what you're seeing in real time is an alliance that is modernizing and the United States and Japan are working in lockstep to be prepared for the emerging challenges in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. Japan and the United States remain united in our concern over China's destabilizing actions. And I want to reaffirm the United States' ironclad commitment to defend Japan with the full range of capabilities, including nuclear. 
Both countries signed an agreement reflecting efforts to deepen cooperation across a wider scope, including space, cybersecurity and emerging technologies. The four of us agreed to promote initiatives in extensive areas, including the effective operation of counter-strike capability based on bilateral cooperation. Cost MNS, NTD News. The counter-strike capability refers to the hundreds of American missiles that Japan would acquire. Having these missiles would allow Japan to strike mainland China and North Korea in case of an invasion. The U.S. also plans to station up to 2,200 troops in Okinawa by 2025. The forces would operate anti-ship missiles to help defend Japan. Another item on the agenda is stepping up U.S. protection of Japanese satellites in space. Blinken said any attacks on Japanese satellites would trigger the two countries to act. Washington has a similar agreement to protect the space assets of NATO allies. But no Asian countries outside Japan has this guarantee from the U.S. Bilateral and multilateral aims. Japan's expanding security network doesn't stop at the U.S. The country just signed a defense pact with the U.K. The deal allows both countries to station troops on each other's soil. It's the first time Japan has made this kind of agreement with a European country. And that's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for two years. Here's what to look out for in our second half. Is a ban on TikTok from government devices enough to deal with the Chinese app's threat? There's still another major step that we need to take, and that is a complete ban on TikTok. But that's not all. Arthur Herman, senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, has a suggestion for how U.S. tech companies could counter the popular app. Tiffany Meyer spoke to him for more on that. The full episode is available on our partner platform Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thank you for watching China in Focus. I'm Don Ma. See you tomorrow.